Welcome to the seventh edition of Tescon Europe Conference. I hope you had enough time to rest before uh, the second day of the conference. So while I'm going to be presenting myself, you can try clicking this uh, button. My name is Nikolai Tlokachev. I'm testing practice lead at Debridge, a cognizance of fusion company, and I'm also a co-host in Poklibe Pekokibe podcast. And today I will be the host for Automation Stage. It's a tremendous pleasure for me to welcome those of you that have been with Tescon Europe for a long time now, as well as those who are new to our community. As every year, Tescon Europe conference gathers groups of like-minded software assurance practitioners together to learn about latest testing trends, disclose the best practices, and gain inspiration to take their expertise to the next level. Yet this year is exceptional. Our community has grown enormously. We received more than 2,100 registrations from 39 different countries, making us the largest online software testing conference in Europe this year. This is a great time for a round of applause, which you can voice in the chat below, maybe there. On today's program, we have two inspiring keynote talks, followed by 19 thought-provoking sessions from internationally or recognized software testing experts and a panel discussion where different viewpoints will be exchanged on future of test automation. Asian, Asian, Asian. Just in moments, we are going to dive right into the first session. But before that, I would like to say a special thank you to our, our sponsors. The Platinum Sponsor, Keysight Technologies. They work with innovators to push the boundaries of engineering to design, emulate, test, and deliver breakthrough electronics. The gold sponsor, JetBrains. Which is a global software vendor that creates professional software development tools and advanced collaboration solutions trusted by more than 12 million users. Also, EPAM. Which leads the industry in digital platform engineering and product development services. The bronze sponsors, M47 Labs, Tessana, mostly AI. Besides, this year we have two knowledge partners who prepared great gifts for you. Pact and Manning companies will award the most active conference attendees who rate sessions and leave comments with the free ebook. Yeah, you heard me right, so don't miss this chance. To round off, I would like to encourage everyone to be active, open minded, and eager to create valuable memories today. So to kick off the second Tescon Europe 2022 conference day, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Mike Talks, who is a technical product owner at, of testing at Tabs, to present the talk, Testing the Next Generation. Mike, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say it's actually an actual pleasure to be here. Um, and also start with a bit of a warning. I am about a week post-COVID, so I may need to take a break occasionally to, to use an inhaler or take a bit of a drink. Please bear with me. Uh, but generally, my recovery is going really well. When I talked about uh, doing a presentation, testing the next generation, I was really excited about this. Um, as you'll find out, it, it really hooks into what I'm doing at the minute, but it gives me the opportunity to really deconstruct what I'm doing, you know, often we'll, we'll be so busy doing something and, and kind of, sometimes it's a bit frantic to take that step out and actually look at the bigger picture. And actually that's a pattern here has been an absolutely fantastic thing to do as I've put this slide together. So let's start with a little bit of who I am. You, uh, I'm Mike Talks. Uh, I work for TAB in New Zealand. Uh, I'm a tester who's based in New Zealand. Uh, you might know me uh, through the through the handle TestSheepNZ. I've blogged and talked a lot about testing in the past. Been a bit quiet recently. Um, and what I'd like to really start with is talking you through how I got here. Yeah, I re really will be going back a little bit because it, it's important. So I started programming in 1982. Um, I, as you can see in the, in the slide, there's me with a very early home computer. And I pretty much got one of these when I was 11 and um, started programming. Started my test career about five minutes later when I put that program in and hit the, the command to run and it didn't really do what it was supposed to do. And that really fascinated me in this, this relationship between building and developing and testing and, and kind of the feedback loop that you get into. I fast forward another 11 years and I trained as a teacher, did quite well as a teacher, taught, taught um, all about um, science and mathematics. Um, decided that really wasn't for me and joined the IT industry in 1997. 
fast forward a few more years and I became a test manager in 2013 and, and all these experiences put together to make me you know slightly unique a little bit different um but let's let's focus on what life was like in 2013 I finally secured that coveted test manager role and you know kind of you know walked into the role as a test manager and and at these days um in 2013 most most of our projects were waterfall projects and the responsibility as a test manager uh, it would fall on my shoulders to make sure that testing was done right and to report about it um and in fact you know my very first gig you it almost always happens i joined a project at a critical junction we were trying to get something out the, out the window out the window out the door even um <clears throat> so my role walking in was really about managing the test managing the reports managing the process yeah and including you know reporting about the defects uh, a lot of my my comms with the teams was all about getting things done really test manager i managed the tests yeah then along came agile and suddenly i didn't have this single team of people underneath me uh there was a i had a testers that were in different teams um our department found waterfall exhausting and i wanted to experiment with a customer about trying something new trying agile and it was a really different world you know uh, now there were either one or two testers on each team and I wasn't sure. It was my role to 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 kind of critique the testing on each thing. Uh, or as I found, kind of amongst other things, the customer didn't want to pay for my time like that. But also that kind of micromanagement didn't really work in Agile. So the role as not so much a test manager, but as a test leader really evolved. And I kind of feel it's really echoed well in this slide, yeah? I went from being a boss to a leader. Um, because, you know, as a boss, you're very directive. It's like, you must do this. I want you to do these tests. I want you to do this. Show me what you've done. As a leader, it's really much more about getting down uh, down with with the individuals and saying, oh, okay, what do you, you know, what are you doing? How, you know, how are we going to do this? Uh, what's your approach? Where do you need help? Yeah. And my role was was not really about managing what they did, but coaching and mentoring them so that they had all the tools that they needed to do that to do their job well, particularly helping to grow them as people. <coughs> Indeed, looking back over the last ten years, it's not the products I've delivered, I've helped to deliver that I felt a sense of pride and achievements with. It's seeing people coming up through the through the ranks in their career and you know and moving up, you know, juniors becoming intermediates, becoming seniors. Uh, and indeed, you know, occasionally working with people who are, who've been uh, manual testers and helping to develop them as automation specialists. So how do you, going back, you know, introducing a new generation, how do people learn to test? Now, uh, you know, Bringing up a uh, an old debate, a lot of people think you know you make a tester by you put them on a two week course of some sort. They come out with a certification, and that's it. You know you, you teach them a set curriculum, and away they go. Um, you've got a tester, you know, and um, and a lot of people are a little bit disappointed that it's not quite that simple. In truth, through about ten years of mentoring. My experience, you know, I'm at the point where I've developed a couple of dozen testers. And I know that's not a huge number, but this is this these are people who I've been um intimately involved with, with regular check-ins and catch-ups. Um and that intensive relationship has helped to do, develop them a little bit at a time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that that later. Uh setting goals, helping them to move up. Uh I've occasionally worked with people within um and you'll, we'll talk a little bit about this more. People like people in service desk that have contacted our HR and say, you know, I'm interested. It's, service desk, okay, but I, I, I'm really interested in getting into IT. I've done, I did an IT degree and I'd like to do more. And I'm really interested in where I could go with testing. And I've, I've often uh, had like fortnightly catch ups with these people to talk about, you know, where they're at and set exercises and just generally mentor them. 
what I've learned through this is, to my surprise, is most people have some aptitude towards app testing. Some aptitude. Da -da -da. So, like, one of the exercises I use to really bring this out <coughs> is uh, the sign-up, uh, you know, looking at a sign-up platform and, you know, put it in front of people and say, okay, here we go, here's something, how are we going to test, yeah? And most people have got some ideas, yeah? And that's really important. Very, very few people have just gotten, you know, I've just absolutely got no ideas. Most people have got some kind of experience. It might be that they've used use something and they found it really tricky or they've, you know, they've heard about something. But most people have got some background understanding of, yeah, there's something I would test about this. So, you know, I put this in front of uh, people and people will come up with... <coughs> Usually the uh, items in li lilac. Yeah, they'll, they'll know. Let's let's try a really long text string in some of these fields. Let's try using special characters. Let's try someone who's too young or it invalid date of, that, date of birth. Someone, let's try with different browsers. Oh, using an Apple device is important. Probably using an Android device is important as well. But there's some extra things that they're, you know, they're going to miss. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I really like to put exercises in things. And, in front of people and, and show, you know, first of all, uh, try them on something and, and they give me feedback. And it's really important to say, yeah, the, what what you're doing out the box is really, really good. And different people will pick out different items from here. But then the job is to work with people to help develop and broaden how they would approach that and say, yeah, these are the, these are things that you're doing. These are things that you, you're doing a little, uh, you're doing intuitively, but actually this, there's some science behind this. You're using heuristics and these heuristics that you're using, you know, too long, you know, maybe, you know, as well as too long, you might want to think about empty and you introduce them to things like um, heuristics and oracles and you kind of broaden how they approach uh, pages. <coughs> but there are some people, unfortunately, that really just struggle with this and, and, and uh, really struggle to go to the next, next base. But yeah, finding people that, that can develop um, uh, you know, with people, with working with people on the service desk, probably about uh, about two thirds of people um, eventually pick it up and do really, really well with it. But some people just, it's just too, you know, they just don't have the right mindset for it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's working with people to see how they can develop. Now, my current role is really interesting. Uh, and, you know, so, so far I've given you, oh, there's some general, general theory, here's what I'm doing. But my current role is really, really focused on the development of people. And you'll see this when you look at the test team structure as of uh, November last year when I joined. You know, we had a tech, one technical uh, slash automation test lead. We had another test lead. We had a senior tester and an intermediate tester. So that's four testers with significant experience. And then we had four junior testers. And those junior testers only had about a couple of months of experience. However, they did have the background of being end users on our systems, and that was really important. They uh, they used they used our systems regularly. They they knew what was irritating. They knew what would be really painful, and that was that was a really good starting position. Um, you know, uh, but you know, two two months into the things, you know, they they were a little green, needed a little bit of help, a little bit of guidance. Often you would, um, when stories would come up, they would approach testing a little bit shallow. Yeah, they wouldn't go into the depth because at this point they're very new and they just didn't know. Um, some felt surprised that testing would involve. Uh, some felt that it, testing would just be involved, like, oh, you know, I usually work. I usually work in the trading center. It will be just like another day in the trading office. But in actual fact, we're surprised the kind of the scenarios that we put through to really thrash out uh, an application and, and try try things that they, they wouldn't normally do on a business day. But when they thought about it, it made sense because it, it tested limits on the system. Um, so yeah, they came in expecting that testing would be a quick rubber stamp, but found it was, you know, there was a little bit more involved and it got exposure to, to, to look at that and develop it. In one-on-ones and catch-ups with it, it was really, really useful to kind of find out and really understand about where people were at, yeah? 
And that really comes to a really f important foundation, yeah? Rapport, yeah? I'm trying not to throw too many defin definitions at you, but rapport is one of those phrases that people like throw around all over the place. And it's like, let's just take a moment to really think about what we what we mean by rapport, yeah? Um, rapport is defined as a relationship character, characterized by agreement, mutual understanding or empathy that makes communication possible or easy. So I'm having catch-ups uh, with everyone in my team, yeah? And this is re a really important concept, yeah? So I'm meeting with them, as a, you know, and I am their manager or, or the boss man, as somebody calls me, yeah? Um, but I'm not, you know, it's really important to build up psychological safety and trust in those interactions. And um, for your mentee to get most out of this, they have to feel like they can be open, that they can talk about things, that particularly they can say when they don't understand things. A really key conversation I had it when I was doing a pairing exercise uh, with one of with one of my juniors was they were asked me, "Are you pairing with us to see what we're doing wrong?" And I really was really glad they came out and said this. I said, "No, no, no, that's not why I'm doing that. I'm pairing with you to see what you naturally do." And this goes back to that point that most people intuitively have an approach to testing. I'm helping you also to understand the theory of what you do intuitively, because there's theory behind it. You probably never thought about it. I'm, I'm here to help kind of broaden your mind. But then, a bit like the exercise I talked about before, I'm here to help expand your approach. So, so here's what you do good. Here are some things where, that you can enhance. Here's some extra things that you can think of and kind of really broaden your horizons and help you to become a better tester. To me, the key thing about these things is the check-ins that really talk and drive about growth. <sighs> kind of a flip side of, of rapport is all about breaking the stereotype and normalizing interactions. Um, I think we've all had a boss who will say to you, oh, I need to have a word with you uh, or book a random meeting with you. But your interactions with this person are such that you, the only time they ever talk to you is something, sometime you do something wrong. Yeah. That, you know, that really needs to be broken as part of uh, anyone that's in a leadership or mentoring. It's really important to just touch base with people all the time, regularly, absolutely regularly, and for it to, to usually be more about praise, for rarely be about criticism. <coughs> Again, it's, it's this point about people being able to show up to a meeting with psychological safety and know, you know, the interactions, is, this is going to be a helpful interaction rather than, oh, oh, you know, James is trying to speak to me again. What have I done wrong now? And just kind of spending all day kind of taking that over. Indeed, in interactions, it's really impo important to try and avoid criticizing because it makes people defensive and you really want people to feel open and to talk about things. If you're re really criticizing the way some somebody's doing something, um, it's very hard for them to say, actually, I'm struggling with something else, yeah. And um, that doesn't mean that, that there aren't things that occasionally you, you do need to bring up. But sometimes, you know, trying to trying to go into a meeting with, with where you are on their side and you are trying to help them succeed. That is the mindset I bring into every time I check in with one of my team. <clears throat> it's really important for breaking the mold. It's trying to get away from this interaction that, that when you're one of your uh, when your leaders speak to you, that you, for some reason, are on, on trial. Now, a fundamental expectation is that people uh, will put their hand up and reach out for feedback. And I can tell you of my, of my team, different members of my team are more comfortable than others to doing that. Uh, again, again, going back to, to normalizing it, I try and lead by example, by when I, when I do something, to reach out for feedback from the team or, or even use some of our team meetings to, to show the, show an approach and, and get feedback and set this expectation that you know it's normal to get feedback yeah and it doesn't always have to be that peer-to-peer -peer feedback it can be you know i i value their feedback you know and not only will i give them feedback on their what they do i expect them to give me feedback as well and making out that feedback is really something that we should be sharing. Again, feedback being a positive thing. It's driving towards 
developing the best approach, developing the best documents, uh, the best tests that we can. <coughs> Uh, and that's a that's a good and positive thing. And you know, utilizing everyone's ex experience always helps to build a better approach to what we do. Even so, it can be an ordeal. Uh, this is my physics lecturer from from university, uh, Professor Fred Comley. He was a wonderful, kind human being, and the first person who introduced me to the techniques where you put somebody else in a position to lead. Right, you know, rather than teacher leading, he, he was very keen into uh, in tutorials, having students leading through topics. And it was hard. I learned a lot from this experience, but some people found it psychologically tough. Different people will come at your relationship with different confidence and energy, and you need to be prepared to dial things down. So, you know, you might, you might, have a conversation or a pairing with someone and you, you bring out a story and you'll you'll um you'll say hey so how are you gonna how are you gonna test this story and some people will just go mike let me tell you how i'm gonna test the story yeah <coughs> but there are some people that will just really really shell up and really find it very 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 stressful you know despite building that rapport it will be difficult so you know with people like that it's sometimes helpful to go okay i'll i'll, I'll get the ball rolling i'll, I'll give an example do you want a, a comfortable following through with an example and often breaking breaking the ice with an example um you know because people say oh, well you know what what does it mean what does it mean kind of breaking the ice with an example and they, even if somebody still can't come up with someone say, okay okay so you you you're finding it a little hard to come out with things. So let's break things down. Let me show you how I'll, I will do that. And so a session with that kind of person will go very differently from that com that uh, competent person that will go, you know, confident, by the way, not competent. Um, oh, this is how I would do it, yeah? Um, but it's, it's trying to find out that different people will react to the same problem very, very differently. And some people will just need a little bit more uh, different, different nurturing in order to, to really start to contribute. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to stop for it. And now, right. So, helping the next generation. Like I said at the beginning of this, um, putting together a slide deck like this is really fantastic because it really, um, it really allows you to take this step back and look at what am I actually doing? What is the pattern to this? Yeah. And I noticed that there were three fundamentals and I struggled and I really played around with these things. And I was like, are they three things like a Venn diagram? I was like, no, no. And as you'll see, I embraced there are three pillars, yeah? So three pillars for helping to develop people. First of all, and we're gonna be talking a lot about this and it's probably, I don't wanna say it's the most important because as you realize there is no most important. But mentoring, kind of how you as a test leader are, um, engage with the individuals within your team who are growing us in their testing careers. Secondly, it's about learning. Now, mentoring is a kind of learning, but as you'll see, I'm picking out something a little bit different. It's, it's having space, having space for people to try out exercises, to go and learn, read to go away and do a, do a course, yeah? So they're not just relying completely on you um, for all their knowledge, you know? As much as, much as I like to consider myself a wealth of information, um, you know, I know automation, but it might be better to send someone an, aut an automation course um, and they might get more out of that than me just mentoring them <coughs> with what I know. And finally, we have growth, yeah? And this is opportunities for people to do things outside of their, you know, their immediate job title, to take on things, to do things, yeah? Again, you know, it's no good somebody talking to somebody, oh, you, you're, you're a manual tester and you'd, you'd really like to try things with automation. Oh, that's great, but then never give them the opportunity, yeah? So growth is a, is not just about growth, but it's about opportunity. And we're we'll, we're we'll, we're we're going to spend most of the rest of this talk really focusing in on these and breaking them down. Now you got those three right. What you have at the top are happy and engaged testers, and that's good for you. That's good for your team. Okay, we'll focus most first of all on mentoring, and we've kind of been 
touching, you know, most of what I've been talking about so far is is mentoring. It's the act or process of, of helping and giving advice to a younger or le less experienced person, especially in a job or at school. This is the dictionary definition. I wouldn't necessarily say younger. I've been, I've mentored people who are old, older. I've had younger people mentor me. So, you know. A little bit ageist. Um, it's typically done within an organization. Um, and if, but if you're in a, a small company or working in a niche, you might find that there, you know, some of this might need to be done by somebody outside. An example of this might be, for instance, you might work in a small company and somebody wants to be mentored in, about security testing. And you like look at your team, it's like, well, we don't have any security testers. It's a good time to reach out and say, well, we need to get you either some some training externally, but also maybe a, more of an ongoing mentor. Now we've we've got an arrangement like this with uh, one of my team, uh, two of two of my team who are into automation. You know, there's an automation specialist house uh, in Wellington, and they look after uh, a couple of hours training and mentoring each week so that they can check in. I could do some of that. They can do it so much better. Yeah. And that's really important, knowing your limits and really getting some getting somebody that's doing a job every day. You know, they're gonna they're gonna do it so much better than I am. Yeah. Because I'm just not hands-on enough at these days. Um a key meeting is that this one-on-one. -on -one. This is a regular meeting. Could be fortnightly, could could be monthly. I have bigger more meetings with my junior testers than with with my seniors because you know they're, they're really new to the new to the industry industry and they just need a little bit more intensive time for checking so we're going back on a theme here the old uh, you know old school management line manager would only be involved with someone when something went wrong no it's really important to meet with somebody regularly and just really have a a, a time and a space to check in there's some schools of thought that say that you know your agenda should be Something like, you know, what progress have you made towards your goals this month? And that always, I think, should be in the back of uh, a meeting. But as much as possible, I try and turn this meeting over to the other party to talk about whatever they want to. This can be about automation, testing approach, or how we generally deal with things. And, but sometimes people just really want to talk about personal things, things that are going on in their life that are affecting their work, you know, or just, just really difficult. I found... <clears throat> I found occasionally that when people are going through a rough time with family, giving them space to talk about is really important. And again, people won't talk to you about stuff like this unless you've built that report, built that trust that you can be trusted, that you, that you are somebody that can listen and is, you know, is, is not phased and won't just sit there, arms crossed, and shake the head and judge. Now, pairing is another really important technique, you know. In a one-on-one, -on -one, it's just, you know, it's you and your mentee and you're just talking about things. Pairing is a bit more, here's something and we're going to focus it. Let's talk me through how you do a test. Talk me through how you do, you know, how you test this thing, how you do this, how you use a particular part of the system. And <clears throat> essentially, it's, it's a bit like a driving driving activity. So, you know, one of, the, one of you take the wheel of the activity and the other person gives feedback. Um, We tend to think of it mainly as, as a junior driver and a senior commenting. Uh, again, to get the most out of this, rapport is, is really key. People need to feel easy to share, like they're not being judged and assessed. You know, like, you know, the the driving the driving test where you somebody's sitting in a wheel and somebody's next to them with a clipboard and touching, touching, clicking their tongue and kind of making big marks with red. Um, it is important, though, to give feedback, but remember, you know, not just pick out the bad, you know, okay, you know, here's something you could try, here's a, but also reinforce patterns. You're doing this, it's really good. I'm really pleased to see how you approach this. Um, <coughs> and remember, it cuts both ways, yeah. Um, I have very rarely done a pairing session where I didn't learn something, yeah, particularly um, with, with our juniors. They'll show me using it, uh, they'll show the use of a product and I'm like oh, I didn't know the product could do that because I very I very rarely get hands on on the product and they'll show me a corner of it it's like that's really interesting I didn't know that <coughs> but sometimes I, as well it's we've had to flip flip things around sometimes I've 
um, had to drive and do a show and tell myself about, oh, here's how we use Jira. Here's how we use, um, here we, here's how we use test rail, our, our testing tool, or, you know, just here's how, how I put together a matrix. You know, so it's, you know, it's not always the junior at the driving wheel. Sometimes it's really helpful to, to, to show as well. And by the way, you know, you reap what you sow. If you were, uh, if you are overly critical in, in uh, pairing and you get behind the driving wheel, you know, expect what, you know, expect what you, to get what you give. I really, you know, also really important, you know, all these kind of meetings are, but it's the ad hoc meeting. Yeah. Every organization I've ever worked on has, has claimed, you know, we've have an open door process, you know, you can always reach out. But, you know, when one of my testers reaches out because there's something that they just really don't get, I'm confused, I don't get to, I really want to talk about it. Making sure that meeting happens in a timely way and you've got this opportunity to check in. Um, being available, turning up, you know, um, is really important. Again, it goes to, goes to rapport. It, it shows that, you know, it's not, you know, saying, I, you know, open, I've got an open door process. Um, I don't know. And I've got an open door policy, sorry, uh, is no good if you don't ever open the door. Yeah. So, you know, these, these sessions are really good. They give timely help to people that really need them. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're really, really valuable. And people, if people are reaching out to you, you are doing something right. Yeah. And finally, within the mentoring, it's really useful to have team sessions. So, so far, it's me and another member of the team, me and a different member of the team. Um, there's a lot of power in interactions that are just you and somebody else. You know, it, it's very easy for people to be open, but sometimes it helps to get other people together as a group. You know, so you know we have a we have a few types of, of meetings. Uh, it's useful to have a regular check-in with the whole test team. We do uh, we do a Monday morning 10 a.m. check-in where we just grab a coffee and we say you know it starts off with um, how was your weekend and leads into okay here's our main goals you know here's here's the main things that are going on uh, with us this week yeah and you know and everyone reads in you know this is what I'm working on this is the main thing that we're trying to get out yeah we have a fortnightly meeting where we talk more as a test team and we talk about strategies and approaches. Um, and sorry just a second oh, this might be a new piece of technology uh some new products that are coming out um or just just uh people things that are going within our organization um i have separate meetings with seniors and i have separate meetings with the juniors and the juniors are a bit more focused on education so we have a fortnightly one hour session and three till four on Fridays, great way to wind up the week where it's just like, well, okay, let's, let's take a subject within testing and explore it. What do you want to know about? And some of this has been, how do I do a test script? What's a defect? How do you write a good defect? Um, to, okay, how does the architecture work for our systems? You know, let's, let's talk about, you know, things like what, what, what do we mean by front end and the back end and middleware and stuff? So we, we've, we've covered items like that. Okay, so we, we've covered that. So that's our first pillar. Second pillar is learning. Um, and of course, mentoring is a type of learning. But here I'm, I'm bringing out, you know, uh, other learning opportunities that you have for staff that don't just involve meetings with you or, you know, or within the team. Now, one of the biggest things to do is ensure that you've got actual time for people in your team to learn every organization says that staff learning and growth is really important but it doesn't tend to happen if staff are pressured to spend all their time on productive work yeah there needs to be an allowance for people to to spend time learning whether reading a book or going through a video tutorial or just experimenting and experimenting to me is one perhaps one of the biggest things um <coughs> <coughs> On a past project, we used to have the FedEx days. That meant that once a month on a Friday, fantastic Friday it was, uh, we'd just turn up to work and we'd have a whole day to try something out. And we didn't have to be accountable. It didn't have to add value. We just needed to say what we'd learned from it. 
And unfortunately, when COVID hit, you can guess, and this was at the previous organization, uh, you can guess what got cut back. And it got cut back, it never came back. But they were really vital um, to kind of try things out and learn things. I'm a strong kinesthetic learner, and that means I tend to learn more from doing than listening to someone explain what they're doing. Yeah, so I really like to kind of get my hands dirty. Uh, that's how I tend to learn programming language, how I tend to build websites. Um, so having a day where I can try things out, I don't have to prove myself as being productive, is a real big benefit, yeah? If you look at my website, uh, testsheet.github.io, you'll see some things that, uh, like uh, testing apps and automation that I've put together as a learning exercise. And often I feed this back into my mentoring as things people can try testing. Um, at my current uh, engagement, I've been able to swing a few days for dedicated learning that very much follow this kind of uh, model. So, you know, if you look on my website, you'll see there's some bizarre calculators, which depending on which build you use, they do odd things, yeah? Just a way of exposing uh, some tests to things and, and learning and and basically trying things out and going, you know, have it, try out your observation on this, try, try out your test, test approach, test this, T then tell me what, <coughs> sorry, test this and then tell me uh, what you've learned and if there's anything a little bit odd for that. Um, beyond that, of course, there is just training, actually getting somebody in to talk through, uh, almost ending them away on a course to go through su some subject material, yeah? But I think we talked right at the beginning of, you know, we talked about, oh, how do you get a tester? You put them on a on a several day course, they come out with a certificate, you've got a tester. Um, and I said that wasn't the way to build a tester, but it is important. It's just not the be all and end all, yeah? Uh, before sending anyone on a course, it's I find it's really useful to be, to have it set up clearly what they what their expectations are and, and how this will help help them on their growth path. Yeah. I feel as well the training is important not to live in isolation. Yeah. To get the best out of a training session, it really helps for pe to people have touched on the subject a little bit beforehand so that it's not completely new. I do know somebody who turned up once to an advanced C programming course and they'd never done basic C++, they would just hope that they would pick everything out. They really struggled, yeah. Um, but it's also important, particularly if it's it's about patterns of behavior, that, that you don't just do the course and then you come back and you never do it again. It's no use sending somebody on a BDD training course if the minute they come back, oh, you really enjoyed that, cool, because we're not doing BDD, but I'm glad you enjoyed it, yeah. <coughs> For me, at the end of any course, uh, and I've done this with a couple of friends. A friend really raved about uh, a CBT um, psychology coaching course that they did. And, I, and it was mind blowing. And I, and, I, and I always say, okay, what did you learn? And what, could, what do you think you can try to introduce based on what you've learned? And that's really important. Getting things in, you know, helping the rubber to hit the, hit, hit the road. And don't just, you know, here's some interesting things I learned and then never use them again. Trying to say, okay, you learned these things. How do we how do we start trying out a few things and maybe incorporating them into what you do regularly? And so there's a little bit about that as, as, as well, which leads us really nicely onto growth. So that this is our that was our second per, pillar, learning. Now we're on growth, yeah. <coughs> There's no point giving people new skills if you don't give them the opportunities to actually use them. Don't send somebody on a Java course and say, well, that was nice. You can't, but we won't let you ever do, do Java program. Don't put somebody on a BDD course and then say, well, we're never going to do that either. Um, so it's really important to have that opportunity, but it's also important, secondly, to make sure that people are being financially recompensed for what they actually do. So, you might see something like this, the, the career ladder. I've kept it simple. Uh, I haven't added automation into this because it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> that becomes a little bit more challenging. But yeah, it's really important that people feel that there is a ladder to climb, yeah? <coughs> because it's things to aspire to, you know. I finally got to that, that test 
test manager position. That was something that I had my eyes on for a few a few years. And yeah, you know, I, I wanted to see that growth to move upwards. And this is this is pretty much the standard job titles that you'll see junior tester to intermediate tester to senior tester to test lead. Yeah. And most people, you know, most people I've mentored have had some aspiration to move up from where they are to something new. Yeah. Um, and to be to be recognized and rewarded them. Um, if indeed, when I talk to, to my junior testers, they were now a year into it, why they moved from the other areas of, of business to take up a career in testing. A lot of them felt they really wanted to work in IT, but mostly that they felt that the job had more career potential. And that was really important. They, they could feel like they could go somewhere rather than, you know, you're in, you're in trading, you're a trader, this is your job title. You never, act, you might become a leader in there, but that's, that's as much growth as you'll ever get. <sighs> Very rarely, though, have I seen organizations where a good career ladder has been in place. Um, and often it's been my uh, responsibility to try and look at it, revise it, and really put something in place. Sorry, I'm going to have to re resort to uh, my ventilator. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry for that. I told you it was coming. So a good a good ladder includes a breakdown of activities and a, a, quite a broad range of things that that, that you expect um, that 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 show that you know you know. When you're working at this level, here's what you will see. Here's what you will be doing. The thing I see is, is a really good litmus, and it's a, a good for de determining the difference between an intermediate tester and a senior tester. A good intermediate tester is good at bringing up problems and how they'll impact on what we're doing. Oh, such and such wants to do this. We can't do this. It'll, it'll have problems. But a senior goes a little bit before, uh, further and has a bit more ownership. They won't just raise the issue, but also suggest ways to deal with that problem. Um, and a good breakdown also looks at what people do in multiple dimensions uh, to avoid just being a simplistic tick box. It's been noticed when you have a really simplistic uh, set of actions that make you uh, uh, about what, what goes where people will look at and go, oh, well, I occasionally do that, therefore I should be a lead tester. Yeah, And that might not be the case. They, people might do do something occasionally. They might occasionally write a report that doesn't, and they, they read, oh, a lead tester writes reports. Okay, I'm, I'm that. Um, but it, it needs to look broadly at what people do in the role. The ladder and expectations in, in my experience really help with annual goal setting. Um, and almost all, every every organization does, um, you know, it, it, let's do an annual review, set some goals, are you working towards it? So it allows us to look at people and say, here's what you do do well. Um, hopefully that, 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 al that, um, that aligns very strongly uh, with what their job title is. But to move up to a new, new uh, job title, here's some things that you might need to look at and really set some goals about, okay, Let's, let's get you some exposure to that. Um, what other competencies do they need? What experience do they need? And really try and work up a plan about moving towards that. <coughs> now, a big part of this is just giving people opportunity. It goes back to what we're doing, what we were saying before. And again, this links back, links back to mentoring. You can see how these, these pillars are really tied together. It's important, you know, it's no good... Um, Someone that aspires to, to be a senior tester, but you never give them the opportunities to do any of those tasks. Not for for any logical reason than simply, oh, we, but we need you to be an inter intermediate tester and only do intermediate testing things. Giving people a chance to try something and support them when they do is really important because it, it it helps people to feel that their career is going somewhere and they're getting growth, and you know they are they are being recognised. Um. Sometimes this might be having a go at creating something like a plan or an exit report or helping out with a production release, uh, giving them an opportunity to use our automations or potentially just giving them opportunity to do things like a bit of business uh, business analysis occasionally, if that makes sense. Now, people might say that growth ladders don't matter. It's things I often say is, you know, we just want a tester, a junior will do. If people don't understand what the difference between different types of tester is, they think that, you know, a junior tester will just test it 
uh, write test scripts, create a test strategy, report to the board, test on mobile apps and triage the defects. They think a junior tester will do that as well as a senior tester, you know, just test normal junior tester stuff. And really the, the um, having this ladder defined helps to kind of address that, uh, address, address that so that everyone, not just the testers, but anyone dealing with my testers know this is, this is the kind of ex expertise uh, uh, that you can expect for a, you know, for a junior tester, for an intermediate, for a senior. But, and also along with this, there's, a, there's that remuneration chat that we don't really like to talk about, but it is really important to say, well, you know, as an intermediate tester, uh, Matt deserves this much. As a senior tester, he deserves this much, yeah? <clears throat> oh. um, and this is really important because, pe you know, people know the level that they work at and they know how much the market will pay will pay for that. And if you as an organization are not paying, um, are not giving the people the right job title, are not giving the people um, the remuneration that they deserve, they know this. And one way or another, you always pay the market rates. You either pay it to your team now, or they go, you know what? The company across the road will pay me the market rate and they leave and you end up having to replace them and you have to pay the market rate for them. Now, of course, this assumes the perfect world, yeah? Um, you know, there's a reason I've gone for this model rather than Venn diagram. You know, mentoring, learning, growth, yeah? If you if you looked at this before, you might go, that looks awfully like a cricket ball, bale, yeah? And indeed, like a cricket bale, if one of these pillars isn't quite right, the whole thing falls apart. It's no good having mentoring if you don't have opportunities to grow. It's no good having learning unless you pick it up with mentoring. It's no good having growth opportunities without mentoring because you'll give people opportunities, but you won't support them when they, they take those new opportunities. So they'll often probably fail. Right, let's just conclude this and wrap it up and we can get to questions. So what have we learned? Well, there isn't a single easy path for becoming a tester. Put the individual who's who's growing at the center of it things and build up around them. Look at what they can do and um, and find, you know, look at, at the way that um, that they need to grow. It's so therefore between any individual, the, the growth path that each person needs to do will be very, very different um, because everyone will be coming at it with a different baseline of what they, they will do int intuitively. <coughs> Realizing this is putting the people at the center of their own journey. And I think that's always a really good start, yeah? For it to be really focused. Secondly, people need guides and mentors. Uh, yes, people need guides and mentors. And just, just because you are the test coach or the test lead, sometimes they need that guide needs to be someone other than you occasionally. And it's sometimes very difficult to swallow your pride. Someone wants to wants to know more about be, doing security tester you might not be the right person who can you find you know, um is it so can you find other experience within the organization is there someone you can reach out to so that they're getting that 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 mentoring also you need training um again you know as as much as you as much as my, i might be a, a speaker a public speaker about testing Sometimes there's areas where, you know, a, a dedicated training course will be better than just, you know, just listening to Mike for a, for a few hours. Ah, and all of this means nothing if you don't have room for growth. Uh, nothing will, is more frustrating than mentoring, putting someone on learning, learning uh, opportunities, but then saying no to them when they want to do something and just not having that opportunity or, or worse still than working at that level and you're not paying them at that level. Uh, just a few plugs. I, um, I've i written a book, How to Test, on LeanPub, which is very much how I, a, a bit of the material that I use and work through um, uh, with people individually. I find on the mentoring, the book Behind Closed Doors, The Secrets of Great Management, uh, is 
deals very much with the, everything we've talked about in Mandarin, particularly the one-on-one. -on -one. And it's an excellent book by Johanna Rothman and S for the Derby. And that is me. Is there any questions? Thank you, Mike. Uh, I really like that you put the like uh, the balance, right balance on this scales where you have on the one side you have technical knowledge and on the other side you have everything else, which is also important, but sometimes we forget about that. So we do have a questions and I'm probably going to start with uh, the most rated ones. Okay. And Vaslo was it? And Vaslovas is asking, is vertical growth career position uh, is important for QA and why? So vertical growth, career position is important for QA and why? Um, it's, I mean, it's just, I talk to my team and they're very, they're very passionate about being paid for what they do, really. And really setting expectations that... Um, that we understand what is meant by each job title and that we pay fairly and according to that rather than i i've worked at other organizations where particularly someone's friend leaves for a different company and they're doing exactly what what um they look at their job title and going oh we're doing the same thing but you you have the better job title and the better salary than me so a certain amount of you know if people are willing to move up making sure that there's a ladder for that. I do know someone, I've seen another question. I One of the best senior testers I've ever worked for, and he's phenomenal. He's absolutely phenomenal. He has zero passion about becoming uh, a, a people, a test lead, a people lead, or anything like that. He is happy where he's at. I've known people who are very happy at just doing it, it intermediate. So, it all, you know, I'm assuming that people want to go up. You know, some people will just go, I'm at this point, I'm good with these responsibilities. I don't really want to go any further. But it's really important to just make sure that you're not forcing an intermediate to do a senior's job for intermediate salary, because that's never good. Have I answered yeah, that question yeah. correctly? Well, I, I think so. Well, Waslos can uh, maybe write an additional one if he, he still has something, some questions unanswered. So the, another question is from Agnieszka. What is the best way to reduce distance between manual and automation testers and encourage them to work together and learn from each other? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, and most of my approach about that is most of my manual tests have become the automation tester, which has been really, really um, <coughs> organic. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the key thing I find uh, and having conversations between manual and automatic te testers is that the, there is there is no real delineation is that really the, the automation testers work on a series of scenarios uh, that are really helpful to test the system and get feedback on the system um but the conversation really should be and often beyond just automation and manual test it starts with the question of what's a really good good and valuable test for our system um, do we have it? Is it easy to put in place? Yeah. And, you know, organizations I've, um, projects that I've seen that have done automation really, really well, they, they've often had just this like um, Excel spreadsheet, isn't embarrassing, where they just put their test ideas in and they'll, they'll regularly meet up and just vote them up and down a bit like the, the votes and say, you know, what's, and, and just so the, the automators are always working at the top of the list saying, what's the most valuable thing that we can work on? So that kind of engagement with everyone about what makes a good test is really key. And again, the automation people actually showing that backwards and saying, OK, you want to know what we test? Here's where you can look. Here's where you can see the scenarios that we're covering. So these are things that perhaps you don't need to worry about manually testing too often. So again, it's just getting everyone in a room, finding space for everyone to be engaging. Yeah, <clears throat> it makes makes sense. Um, okay, so next <coughs> most uploaded question is uh, Stanislav. Uh, hi, Mike. What uh, with what do you usually start uh, with? Real, really beginners with some technical background, knowledge, or testing, or both? Do you have a path? No, I don't have a path, and I think hopefully I made that clear. 
Um, what I, because everyone's a little bit different, but often what I, what I will do, and it goes back a little bit to to what I said, is I will put put a, a <clears throat> I'll do a few evaluations. So I've got I've got a few tools on my website. Um, one, but one of my favourite thing is that login page. You know where I say, here is a login page. How would you approach this? Yeah, and um, that will be my starting position. And then I'll move on to things like. Um, Sorry, if I can show you. Things like um, my testing game, for instance, where um, people will try and guess, play play this game, you know, a number guessing game, and they'll play it a few times, and they'll ask me, ask, ask them to describe to me what's going on. And this is all about defect. And and I'll, I'll run a few exercises like this to just kind of uh, work through, okay, where are they at? What, what do they know to do intuitively? And again, it goes back to that slide way, way, way back where it's like, you know, most people have got, um, let's see if I can find it. Most people have got an approach and it, it's just really finding what they do. I oh, know, I'm, I'm going to, too many slides, I'm afraid. And um, I can't easily go back that many. But yeah, it, it's, it's about trying different exercises to work out where the individual is and then go, okay, what, what makes sense next for this person? Okay, so just a follow up to this question. Uh, someone asked, uh, "What is the link to the site, or how to find it uh, to your website?" Oh yeah, sure. Um, let's try that. I should have really put it in my slides. Bad mic. I usually do. I usually include something. Uh, Testsheet.github.io. And that can be. Okay, there. thank you. I'm always on the lookout for things. And some of this is just because uh, I used to do, we used to do, um, there the used to be, uh, I forgot what the name, testing Saturdays or something. And we'd choose an app to go and to go and test. And it would be interesting to to see everyone do the, the exercise. But usually it was a finished app. So it's the defects you'd find would be really kind of nitty, you know, kind of a bit. Whereas I've de developed software with actual problems so that it actually feels more rewarding when something goes wrong and um, to find those issues. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Yes, we, we do still have a few minutes. And uh, then the last one would be uh, from Robin. I don't think there's a great senior. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think that the great senior has to become a lead tester. In my honest opinion, it often kills his drive and creates an opportunity to a great setback in your team's velocity. Have you ever encountered this? If so, how do you manage this? Yeah. So, the, so like I said, the, the ladder is there for people that want to, that want it, that want to to, to move on. Um, I've occasionally known developers and, and architects. It's like I know I could go f up from here to senior architect or lead and we talked a bit a little bit my, my uh, senior tester as well who is fantastic at senior testing doesn't want to do the the, the lead testing role uh, because they it's it, it takes them hands off yeah and they like the hands on and I miss the hands on sometimes I will be honest yeah um because you know as a test leader you tend to do the testing a little bit less than everyone else quite a, quite a lot less <coughs> so if if somebody doesn't want to move up, that's not a problem. If people, uh, the big thing to do it for me is making sure that people aren't working at a high level and they're not being rewarded. That's a really passionate thing for me, and particularly the organisation I work for. And yeah, and even if, in... if people want want to grow, to have that thing of how can you, how can how what is the path I need to do? What are the steps I need to do? So it's it's important to have it there for people that need it. If people are comfortable, then that's fine. Yeah, I totally agree. And even with the radical candid, uh, candor, in the book, there is a two distinguished uh, roles, like uh, superstar, which wants to grow all the time, and rockstar, who is very good at what he's doing, and he's okay with that, and like everyone's enjoying this company as well. So you need both, I guess, in, to have a successful project. Hmm. So it makes sense. And maybe like one more idea, question. The idea maybe of a bass player that, that's used to playing a guitar with four strings and you're like, do you want to try doing it with six strings? No, I'm good, I'm good mate, with the four strings as it is. Okay, let's get our last question. Okay, so uh, the last one would be... 
by Hugrun, uh, I find there is a huge cultural difference in how people interact with someone who is leading, managing them. How do you communicate with someone who is culturally used to be bossed around and have a hard time with opening or openness concept and sharing their ideas, plans? Leading by example, it really is. It's, it is this thing of, uh, in fact, it came up as an as a, uh, interview question, I believe. It, it is, if you've ever seen somebody working with animals, you, you know, you have to be patient, quiet, earn the trust, um, you know, and, and, and build that trust of being approachable. Sharing with, sharing from yourself, leading by example, I share my work with you. I, you know, I am open. I'm open to feedback from you. Yeah. The, these kind of steps, patience, um, are really important. Um, to kind of opening things up really and you know and the one-on-one -on -one process and just sitting down with somebody and giving them the opportunity to talk rather than be telling them and that's the big thing about one-on-ones i said it, it's led very much by the individual the more uh, uh gita i've forgotten her uh, surname i did a workshop on with her on on coaching and she said as much as possible just ask questions and try never to give advice just give them space to speak and it's difficult at first but it's a really powerful technique yeah so giving that other person space to talk yeah 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 so i i guess that's it for for our like q a session because we're running out of time thank you mike and everyone else uh, you uh, I, we're going to have another session uh, in the automation uh, stage uh, with Benjamin Bischoff. He will be talking about smoke tests and mirrors, the magic in test automation in, well, in four minutes. <laughs> so you can uh, grab uh, like a drink or something. So, and we'll be waiting for you back here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you've really enjoyed that. <laughs> Me too. That was very, very useful. Thank you.